This is the final public forum. This has been an absolute pleasure for me. The faces and the people and everything else, and to quite a cliche, thanks for the memories. <laughs> okay, and with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Charlie. Dr. Walter Charlie is the Vice President of Construction at Wenatchee, Wenatchee um, Valley College and Chief Administrative Officer of the Wenatchee Valley College, Omaha campus in Central Washington. He earned a PhD from Washington State University in biochemistry and biophysics, and he says, thanks for being this child. <laughs> and has over 15 years of experience in higher education. He also holds a bachelor in science in secondary science education and biological science and a, and a MS in biological science from the University of Idaho. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Walker. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The chatter and the energy in the room uh, before I, we started this uh, reminds me of what a good decision it was for me to apply here. Uh, as, as often, you just were energized with each other. I don't know if we get these groups together very much, but the trustees and community members and faculty, staff, students, I hope. Uh, it's just uh, really, really lots of energy here. It reminds me of what a good decision I made in uh, taking this risk and applying. I didn't know that Dr. Garrison was going to be in the room today. I meant to I want to congratulate him and thank him very much. Uh, let's pretend he's not here. He could have easily have not continued his tenure here in these really unprecedentedly difficult times. And I was really proud of academics in general, wherever our leadership is, faculty, staff, in traditional uh, academic administration. And that level of responsibility, it really is a tough thing to come in thinking as a candidate with a $2.3 million deficit. And to take ownership of that and to provide leadership during these unsettling times is a huge statement of the quality of his character, the character of this institution, and I just want to say thank you. The other thing is this, this process should help us all. It reminds us Celebration of Community Colleges, MPC. Uh, and so, regards to who you select, it's a great time for reflection, and I think that's, that's instructive. So, without further ado, I just have one question. How many of you have been to all of the forums, including this one today? Go ahead and raise your hands. Okay, well, congratulations for your dedication over, over and above in this important work, but I want to remind you we have repeatability limits. <laughs> So there will be a test, but I'm the only one taking it. I did, if you do select me as your president, I promise that this will be the last PowerPoint about me you'll ever hear. <laughs> okay, so Wenatchee, Washington is located right there in uh, North Central Washington. I'm going to go ahead and use a different, a different pointer here so you can see a little bit better. So it's not much. It's located in Wenatchee, Washington. The OMAC campus is uh, 90 miles north. It took me longer, it takes me longer to get to OMAC than from San Jose Airport to here. That's 10,000 square mile service district. That's our service district. And uh, over on the right is a picture of our campus from on top of the library. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. There's no funny business with focus there. Uh, it is truly sits on the east side of the Cascade Mountains. So I, I put this here to not celebrate that campus, but that. For me, this is a step forward. It's an opportunity. I'm not running away from anything. Those of you who may have had the misfortune to get into my life and talk to people back there must know that I, I, I'm not leaving a bad situation. I'm moving forward, both in my career. And I, and I, hope, that I, I hope that you see that I am the right person for you at this time as well, and maybe particularly this time, given what we've been through lately. So I'm trying to advance there. Okay, so my background, you heard about uh, Washington State University for my PhD and University of Idaho for the other degrees. I put this slide here because I started with a passion in biology. I didn't know where my career was going to go. Sounds familiar to our students, right? And that's where I was. I did, I'm my first generation going to college. My mom immigrated from Europe. She got her citizenship in her 40s. Neither of my parents went to college. My mother, thankfully, championed education for her two sons, and I am a beneficiary of that. I didn't do well when I first got to the University of Idaho. 
I struggled. I got Fs. I didn't even know you could withdraw from a course. In fact, I thought, come on, if you didn't do well, just take the F. So uh, I know this sounds a little bit ridiculous. This is way back when, and I'm from New York. Uh, I'm not from the state of Washington. I was raised in downstate New York. Uh, my, uh, my passions became teaching. I went, as you know, into secondary science education. And then that degree here, that's kind of sounds different, that degree at the University of Idaho is a degree in biological sciences that prepares people to be community college educators. As you know, in the 60s and 70s, uh, perhaps we had a lot of uh, undergrad degrees in a content area and a master's in education. Nothing wrong with that present preparation. This was an alternative. Let's get that master's degree in a content area and make sure you understand sound teaching and learning principles. So it was in the Department of Biological Sciences. So that's what that degree was about, and my uh, education plan was to get be a community college educator, and I was. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And then later on, of course, a degree, a research degree from Washington State University. And uh, in, that, in that experience at WSU, I was uh, part of an NIH fellowship. Uh, it was a biotechnology training fellowship. I did an internship in industry in Seattle. I spent three months there as a student. Zyogenetics, beautiful on the shore of Lake Union. Um, I, my research won a student award at an international competition. I did well in that regard, and I went on and I worked a little bit in private industry. So this is, uh, you know, rule number one, well, in PowerPoints. Although I did see some of the PowerPoints presented lately, we did go through them bullet by bullet. I'm not going to wade you through that <laughs> career path. I want to point out maybe the bottom, the middle, and the top, and I don't break those in importance. So I started in community colleges as a faculty member at Seminole Community College in biology, wrote an NSF grant. So in addition to teaching the things that we teach in biological sciences, and I saw a uh, beautiful new life sciences building this morning, and aquarium, the marine aquarium, I'm so proud of that. Uh, I wrote a grant that had to do with biotech education, and not only did we change the curriculum at the campus, but then I offered K-12 teacher training workshops. The few biologists in the room would recognize the time, late 80s, early 90s. Gene cloning, was that was, that was the, the key disturb, disturbance to the system, so to speak. That was the main technology advance, and we had to get that into the K-12 system. Anybody teach AP biology? If your children have taken AP biology, laboratory number six was about gene cloning, and none of the high school teachers knew how to do it. So we set up teacher training workshops in Florida. The University of Florida recruited me from that experience to do it statewide. I also did an international. I worked uh, Malaysia a little bit, and we had visiting scientists there. Okay. Now, when at Valley College, College, uh, in the state of Washington, we don't use the word apportionment, we use the word allocation. We have a much more generous funding model than you do. You have far, Dr. Garrison and the community, you have struggled with far fewer resources and tools. We, our budget is bigger than 15 or 14 point some odd million dollars. That's just the state portion of it. The bottom, this graph was uh, provided by my, uh, the Vice President of uh, Admin Services. The bottom point on it was a projection, and we're a little bit higher than that actually, but we've lost 30% of state funding. And we, like you, are mostly state funded, but we're a little bit less. We're about 85% dependent on state funding. Uh, we have other, some other routes that we utilize. But this was tragic and traumatic, and just feeling this, I feel the campus move right now. I see it in the announcements. I certainly heard it in the first interview questions. I'm not, I'm not sharing with you my vision for what should happen. That's a community thing that we do, and Dr. Garrison has led that. He's been communicative. He has gained, garnered participation, and you have done that, and that's the way we work for those things. But I can tell you that in our college right here, we lost 30 full-time employees, 60 full part-time. We're a little bit smaller than you in terms of our, our employee numbers. We have 75 full-time faculty and 160 part-time. Ratios are different in Washington. But right after we did that, that move, we still had to run a campus. And so we learned a lot about ourselves. We learned a lot about the psychology of organizations. Organizational psychology follows human personal psychology. And we use those academic teachings to drive the way we were going to continue working. So I put this up here. You can't read, unfortunately. This is Maslow's hierarchy of need. Those of you who go back, and here we are in the introduction to psychology. But uh, this slide reminds us that 
Uh, we are a human institution, obviously. 86 or so percent of our expenses are in salaries, etc. It's a very human activity. So as the individual goes, so does the universe, so does the institution. So we certainly keep this in mind. And the tough thing about this is, at the top here, we can't read it. This is self-actualization in Maslow's uh, 1943 paper. But really, up here is where you, we do our best work. It's where we're creative. It's where we can accept difficult facts. It's where we can do our most intellectual work the best. The problem is, you can't do that unless you have security of your employment, your food, etc. So that's the challenge of leadership. And that's the challenge of all of us as leaders. And that is, that is what I feel the culture is that I'm interviewing for. That's what I've picked up on those wonderful YouTube presentations. I feel I'm joining that already, a spirit of inclusion. And that's a very healthy place to start or to continue along this tough process we're in. Uh, I, this is a little bit about what I've done with the community, but of course, anytime we talk about our strife and econ economic losses, we know we're impacting our students with our decisions and our communities. And it's at these times and other times, we always certainly uh, stay connected with them. So here is a snippet of some of the things I've done. I worked on a healthcare skills panel. It's a local panel of industry leaders to where, where we need new employees, the types of things we need the college to help us do. Then we either start a new program, modify a program, bring in selective uh, changes to the curriculum. The Nurses for Tomorrow was a fundraising campaign. That was the title of it because nobody understands, you know, when you say, well, we need a radiologic technician. And they go, uh -huh. But if you say, we need more nurses, everybody, they, you know, it's just a marketing piece. And we certainly did that. The campaign was on $2.1 million. We built a $23 million building. We added a second cohort of 36 nurses in spring start. We have a fall start. Uh, we did a lot of them in that building. You'll see some pictures of in a second. Uh, was a fabulous addition to our campus, and we put biology in there, and administration. There are other community uh, connections that we had up there, but I want to move to your questions here. This is the building I was talking about. This is, oh, it's about 26,000 square feet nursing, uh, and a one-stop shop like we have here for student services, where you get advising, and financial aid, and cashiering, and orientation, and ed planning. Second floor is allied health and mathematics, and nursing is part of our allied health area. And third floor is administration and biology. This is a new music and arts center, 23,000 square feet. Those four big windows are studios that face north. Capture North Light Light that you artists, wherever you are, and you know you like it. The roofs are cantered up to capture that. And these two studios on our left hand side actually have a garage. The wall is a garage door, like for a semi, so it's not windy out. Students can take the easels out and paint and draw. And we like to think of if you were inviting a gifted <coughs> artist to come stay at your house, what room would you put them in? How would you treat them? We feel it's a world class facility. And uh, that was done during that construction just ended. Like you have your 65th anniversary. This coming Saturday, we had our Music and Arts Center grand opening last Saturday. So, open forum. That's one of your wonderful quotes on campus that I think frames our thinking for what we are about to do now and in the future. So, what are your questions, sir? Thank you. I have a question. Declining support from the state and shrinking local tax bases have driven many community colleges to look for new sources of revenue, such as government grants or private donations. And these same forces have also encouraged some colleges to look for more entrepreneurial ways to generate revenue. What is your experience in bringing extra funding to a community college? And do you have any ideas on how to bring new revenue sources to Monterey Peninsula College? Uh, you know, your CHOM program, I learned a lot about this morning. And uh, I there you are. Uh, the, uh, that's a fabulous approach that you've already taken when you get partners that are actually part of operations. That's amazing, not one time money. That is fabulous. And, uh, what I've done, I touched on a little bit with Nurses for Tomorrow. Our nursing program is actually quite large. We used to accept uh, 55 nurses in the fall in Wenatchee, 20 nurses in the fall in OMAC. OMAC is a really small town. And then we do 36 nurses in Wenatchee every other spring. That's a lot of nurses. So uh, the, 
the additional cohorts came from the community saying we need more nurses. If you go back just what five, six years ago, the national nursing shortage, nursing hiring has slowed down a little bit. So they came to us with a need, they came to us with some one-time money, and we got busy. And this was my president, obviously. I was director of Allied Health. In that role, I had full responsibility in working with the faculty, you know, the faculty. Uh, we have shared governance as well, and those hirings are not done by me alone, right? But I had basically a dean role then. I didn't have a dean title, but I played a dean role. Uh, we put together the need, we put together our needs, myself and Ms. Visser, our nursing director, and who reported to me, and we got busy. We gave those presentations to the fundraisers, our president, and we gave them. Every Tuesday night, it was either me or Linda in our art gallery where we held community forums for two years, donors coming through. We had CEOs of local hospital, the local clinic, the local long-term care, and, and we were part of a fundraiser. So we, we raised those funds. So it's $2.5 million. We still have more than half of that now because we were successful in getting state money. So, so that campaign was to pay for a pre-designed study. In the state of Washington, you get a biennium, you get two years for a pre-designed study with your architect or by yourself, two years for a design, two years for construction. The, the fundraiser paid for pre-design. I was the chair of the pre-design committee, which is very much faculty-driven, but we had broad spectrum, including in the community. And we designed that beautiful building. We used the, the power the power of the nursing shortage and the high priority of nursing in the state outcome of funding decisions for proper space to tuck along the you know the dogs of the funding model, which is administration, et cetera. But we put in so we, we went from just a nursing building that we had to this fabulously big building. Anyway, my role was to I did a lot of presentations. I did actually go in and ask for money with the foundation director. Much rarer, that was more of the director's job and the president's job. Uh, and we were, but informing that and being part of that from, from start to finish. The same is true for the Music and Arts Center. Towards the end of that, the artists took it and ran, the art and music folks took it and ran. But we had many, many, if you go back and Google Natural Valley College and the Music and Arts Center, very controversial about building a music and arts center in the middle of a financial crisis when our wait list for chemistry was this long, and you know, we had a commitment to low enrollment performance humanities, and we had a commitment to STEM. Now that doesn't mean any low enrollment performance humanities at any time, any quarter, either campus. That's not what I'm saying, and I hope that's not what you're hearing. But we had a real commitment to that. We were in a very rural area. The college's mission was to provide a cultural center now, uh, you know, what, what better way to provide cultural opportunities for a very large and diverse and rural district than to be a, a go-to place for music and art. Anyway, those are some of the things I've done. I've also I wrote a grant for high demand nursing funding where our funding came in at $9,000 in FTE. This was about five years ago to sustain the, the program. Got eight, there were 100 on the table, 34 community colleges in the state, was high demand competition, not just for nursing. Not all 34 have a nursing program, but probably 28 do. 100 high demand FTEs on the table, and we, when Atchee Valley College is the eighth smallest school out of those three, we're pretty small. We got 18 of those 100 high demand. So it was a very good pro project, and I wrote that grant. I wrote an NSF grant earlier in my career. I think we may have uh, covered that, but I like the uh, idea of the chomp. Concept and the more that we can do that in perhaps some other areas, the better. Uh, that it might be time for our local industry, and not time, like they already have, but we really need to turn to those partners perhaps and look for more sustaining ways that we can contribute to the college. And the college can look for more sustaining ways to really serve those industries and right with their bottom line. You know, we need international students to help them open up markets in other countries. That's a nice. That could be a start. Thank you. Please tell us what you know about our education center, including the Marina Campus and Public Public Safety Training Center, as well as future planned public safety training sites, and describe your vision for the future of this part of our district. Uh, I was there this morning. I, I know I couldn't make it on the tour, so I actually the last time I came in interviewed, I drove through, but today I was actually able to get into a classroom, stepped in on. Uh, 
Algebra 1 in the morning, Mr. Washburn, and that's some of his students. Um, it's a beautiful campus. I guess I'm going to start, uh, pivot a little bit from the question to say you saw my role in OMAC. That role in OMAC is uh, sort of, if we were a multi-campus district, we're not officially, like MPC, we don't have base funding for OMAC, uh, but we still make a commitment there. Uh, I understand how having a bricks and mortar presence in another part of our service district can really open up uh, opportunities for students. And as I see it now, what I understand part of the question, what do I understand about that? The, the Marina Center, anyway, is as a front door, it's as a point of entry. It also takes you out of the need to drive that commute. I was talking to some folks in HR this morning, interesting commute. If you're on the road at, at quarter to eight from uh, Marina, you're in a traffic jam, but if you're on the road at 8.05, you're not. That's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but you miss your eight o'clock class. So, uh, as a point of entry, I think it's fabulous. You know, centers like that, community college speak, do those things. They open up, they, they say we're dedicated to a population of the service district. They serve that role. Uh, and certainly, it's point of entry. In terms of expanding programs, I'm going to take a risk. You know, I'm not from the state of California. You know, I don't know the details. So, I think I picked up some things in Dr. Garrison's talk that when I first interviewed, I didn't mention. But if we don't have that base funding, I believe if you get to that 1,000 FTE students, about $1.1 million in base funding is provided. Now, I imagine that that in the state of California is probably either in great peril of shrinking or has already gone. But if it's not, that's, that getting that base funding, would I would say we would want to have in our on-campus advisory groups and all hands on deck as to how we can do that. Well, we don't have 1,000 FTEs there. Roughly 500 FTEs, maybe, or give or take. So, uh, if we can base some hybrid or some online courses out of the Marina Center, we might be able to generate those FTE students and count them there. While that funding, if it is, uh, as I said, I'm taking a risk. If it is still on the table, we need to get that base funding for that campus. We, we have a we have a priority. We have made a statement there. If we can Funding. Let's get it. If it's a matter of FTS students, let's generate. And I do understand the difficulty of that in a push and then world. But what I'm saying is we have a commitment there. Let's do everything we can, as you are, to get that, that base funding. Okay. Thank you. What is your philosophy concerning how college administrators should function together as a team to provide leadership to the institution? How do you see all of the administrators in the college participating in various campus decision-making processes? Well, uh, very much like I led with uh, in some of my anecdotal comments, uh, our administrative team needs to be connected, it needs to be inserted, it needs to be embedded, it needs not to be separate. And I, I felt like my introduction was going a bit long, but as we climbed out of our 30% reduction, uh, and this is not ingratiating, this is true. We did not do that without our faculty and our frontline administrators working like this versus the camps, the adversarial camp model. So our administrative team needs to be embedded, needs to be inserted, needs to be communicative. And that's a really important piece because trust is about what's going on behind that closed door. We really don't want that happening at all. Certainly the, the YouTube videos I've seen from Dr. Garrison does not that I'm up in Wenatchee watching those, do not suggest that there's a closed door. I mean, they're very open, they're very transparent, they're not hiding things, it seems like all options on the table. So uh, our administrative team needs to be obviously embedded with our group, they need to be talking with each other, uh, that's, that's a reference to our nature of community college, I'm not speaking specifically of MPC, of being silo and turf oriented, we need to break down those, break down the silos. So one thing that you did see from my bio, is that information technology actually reports to me. Now, I don't ask me about your cell phones or your computers, right? We had an information technology department that's separate, much that, like you do. Please don't hear judgment in this. We're a very small college, not, not that small. We're, we're, we're fairly large. But we, uh, we just couldn't have the information technology department here, and we didn't have an instructional technology department. So with all these winds of change and how all these tools that our faculty are making, uh, making uh, available for their students, 
we would get in a queue, you know, I mean, there's the phones we have to string to that office, and then we have to get these computers up, and then, oh yeah, that new learning management system has to go down here in, in slot six. So we collapsed ITV together, and that collapsed silos. Our person over ITV is uh, Mr. Hirsch Tudor, and he is the Dean of Library Services and, uh, and Learning Technologies. And so that was a major reorg we did, and it's just been fabulous. You know, one of the things that I mentioned in our in interview is that while we work through this cut in, in funding, and we work through implementing student task force, student success task force for its recommendations, community college landscape is changing. You know that. We have Stanford just up the road offering courses for free to 100,000 students. So I see our Vice President of Instruction. Now, we're not going to be afraid of this. These are opportunities, but the, the landscape of community college education has changed. And if we're too hunkered in, and we have to be, right? Remember Maslow's hierarchies? We have to do that. And at the same time, we have to get ready to handle hundreds of thousands of students. They're going to show up with a certificate from Harvard for introduction to psychology, and they took all their classes in a secure environment, all their tests, and they're going to say, I want credit for prior learning, and they're going to get that credit. So those are some of the changes and some of the opportunities. So getting IT to be more totally ingrained into the system was a way we took our administrative team and forced that confusion. It's been fabulous. It's just been fabulous. Just recently, Governor Brown signed into law the Student Success Act of 2012. How do you think implementation of these mandates will impact student services here at MPC? Please respond with the assumption that Prop 30 passes this November, and again, as if Prop 30 fails this November. Okay. September 27th, I think, was that day uh, that it was signed in. Um, well, it's certainly going to change things, and uh, before, I, before I go on, uh, I, you know, when we in community college systems have legislation like that, that's broad and sweeping, and not necessarily campus by campus based, uh, not necessarily based on, not at all, frankly, based on the actual demographics of most community colleges, the legislation is going to come with some bumps, it's going to come with some things that don't fit. For example, uh, so what will that mean for student services? Well, student services obviously is going to play a very focused, like, and I don't mean this to say it's not, it's going to be playing an ever more important role and focused role in all of the campuses in the state of California. So uh, how will it change? Well, right now we've got nine of the 22 recommendations are the first up, and there's two that I'm reading are linked directly to some funding. And those are getting a common assessment and also reporting on our scorecards. So those two right away uh, are ones that we have to focus on. So what I'm familiar saying with on my campus, back in Wenatchee, looking at our Vice President of Instruction, uh, is that funding is going to play and finances are going to play a necessary and disproportionate role in our decision making where our focus used to perhaps be, wow, let's do this, it's a broad curriculum, let's try that in our community, wouldn't that be great for it? Now we really have to focus. So if there, there's nine recommendations coming, two are directly related to some possible funding, we, we need to focus on those. But the assessment, common assessment piece and the uh, scorecard. So in terms of uh, Prop 30 passing, as I understand it, it's gonna stop the bleeding, but it's not gonna restore the base. So that feels like where we are with our deficit spending. That's our staff. Uh, we need to think about all of these humans and all of their work uh, and what they do and see if we need to reorganize where we have people and what they're doing, how technology plays a role. So you can see these advisory groups, these task force groups all over campus, fully in integrated administration staff, faculty talking about, here are our resources. How can we meet these task force recommendations? Assumption one, no new employees. That's assumption one. Assumption two, let's do that again, but let's add selectively. If we have to take resources from some other place and put them there, what would they be most critical to least critical? And, you, and the team starts working on those. I don't have those answers for you. I don't know your frontline staff. I don't know how many you have in certain places. The emphasis is on initial advising. These are good things. 
I've been on your webpage, your STEP program, you're there in terms of you know the steps that you, you know, students coming in. I think it's a matter of compliance, following up with students. Uh, the data will be collected. Dr. Ryan will be able to collect those data. We'll be able to put them on the web page. That's not particularly difficult to get those two pieces met. The unfortunate thing is, up in the state of Washington, a college called Green River Community College has uh, a wonderful model for placing students, and it's not based on single point entrance tests. It's not based on the compass test or the, uh, the MDTP test, yeah, that we have here. Uh, it's based on an interaction between high schools and colleges and trying to use the transcript to best place students, requires more people, not less. Okay, Proposition 30 uh, does not pass the stock Well, with that type of legislation in place, I don't think we're going to be able to cut student services. Now, that's kind of a broad statement, right? And we know that there's all kinds of ways we can look at every part of our campus and find ways to be more efficient. I'm talking about broad, large amounts of money that we're going to be able to find. I think we, we really need to, that legislation sort of protects that to a degree. I, um, I, I'm really happy you're working on that. <laughs> and, uh, I will be with you. It would be a collaborative, broad scale, focused advisory committee. I can't come in, but if I were in the state of California, say that's what we would do. But we, we, you know, the, the noble goal of trying to help students be more successful is what I would choose to believe is at the heart of it. Completion agenda is hard. Uh, there's a, you know, maybe that's another question. There's a lot of parts to this legislation that fundamentally changes the community college system that I love, that we all love. Um, most of our students are part-time. More than 50% of our students take less than six units. Um, so the completion agenda is, you know, uh, enrollment priorities, those are really troubling things. I don't know if I answered that question, I don't know if any one person can. As you may know, we are, we are currently on stability funding. What actions or approaches would you take to increase FTES production at a sustainable level? What is your opinion of using instructional service agreement contracts to generate FTES? Uh, I think it's fundamentally healthy to, to keep enrollment healthy. And uh, just, a general, just as a general statement, obviously, obviously that's true. But sometimes we're just trying to make that band right into that apportionment, right? Right into our, what was it, 7,000 that we had recently. Uh, and not and not one more. I think that online approaches, certainly contracts um, such as that, are are very valuable. Um, the uh, part of the student task force initiative that I'm really concerned about is the language where only those courses that have been defined by the system as being part of an education plan get to count towards apportionment. And I don't know how, when you're just rolling that out, that's going to be difficult to predict. And so I hope there'll be some forgiveness of this. You see what I'm saying? We can't just increase FTES. It has to be an increase of FTES, at least a, a large portion of it, within that rule that's tracking with student education plans. So uh, I am... Uh, hearing impaired, I'm relational, I love face-to-face -face classes, but technology gives us lots of opportunity. I have three daughters and a spouse that I have those daughters with. She, I think, I played more of a role. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. My oldest today is taking an online psychology class. She's gone back for a second degree in nursing. She's doing an accelerated baccalaureate program. And she's choosing an online option because she doesn't have to fit it around her work schedule. She can work, she can, uh, you know, she doesn't have to, she's a waitress right now. She needs hours when she can get hours. So, so things like that are, are very helpful. Um, so I think that through uh, using technology for sure and opening up some, some markets in that regard will be very helpful. And I would certainly support the already ongoing uh, initiatives to, for international students. We have that agreement with uh, Cal State Monterey Bay expanding that those international students bring educational opportunities for our campus, not just the money that they pay. They, they, and Monterey has long been an uh, international destination uh, for a lot of reasons. I think we could really support that as well, bringing some different money. Thank you.
The college has struggled with replacing technology as equipment and software becomes obsolete because of limited resources. How would you prioritize the replacement of these items? Uh, well, I wouldn't prioritize this as very, very high. We're in the day and age of uh, technology enhanced, and I'm not just talking about smart classrooms, but technology enhanced learning opportunities, learning management systems, they come under names like Blackboard, Angel, Canvas. We are converting to Canvas because Canvas will allow our students to use their cell devices better versus having to have a computer hooked up to fiber optics, which doesn't happen in North Central Washington, where we serve Native American populations, we serve Anglo populations in very, very rural areas that don't have fiber. So it has to take priority. We're in a data-driven um, world. We have lots of options for our students. Having a common system at a college is expensive. I think we need to make that a priority. And we just got through with me tripping over the Prop 30 question. So I, you know, it has to become a priority. That communication, that that seamless link between students taking classes, capturing their outcomes, contracts, uh, throughout the system. I'll point to our, uh, IT, our IT group uh, and say that our local IT person has developed their own portal system. And if any of you have worked with PeopleSoft and those types of things, they cost millions of dollars, years of implementation. And our small IT, IT group we just developed a homegrown port. We didn't have a portal system for our students. Uh, we have a portal system. It's developing faculty are informing the population of that. Students are informing that. So I think a common system is essential. We need it to be efficient. We need it to identify our data, report our data. We need it so that our students don't have to learn some, I mean, if this is playing out in front of our students, they, if there's too much difference in what uh, one faculty member's page looks like just their page that they go to when they go to a course versus oh, the calendars over here on this online class or if you're using technology for your face-to-face -face, same thing calendars over here but over here Walt's got the calendar Walt doesn't even have a calendar over here and that's like walking into a room like this and every time you walk in sometimes the seats in some room are going this way and sometimes they don't have any doors I'm talking about the consistency of a, of a learning management system. And that's not academic freedom. That's not, that's, that's like this academic freedom we preserve and we protect. But creating a predictable learning environment, we remove the barriers of people trying to figure out, you know, when you go to a site, you want to buy something, and it's been a while since you've been on Amazon, and where do I go to pay for this? You know, <laughs> over here. They make that real quick. So I would rank it at a very high priority. Our technology system being integrated, being singular, will in the end make us more efficient upfront cost, but in the end will be more efficient if we have a more common and universal technology plan. Thank you. How do you see distance education growing at MPC? How might this affect the demand for bricks and mortar space? Uh, you know, I think bricks and mortar space, we have such an opportunity. Um, so, bricks and mortar space I don't think is going away. I think what we do have to worry about is as, as our legislators uh, become very, very involved in the day-to-day -day operations in higher education, I'm worried that the perception is that you don't need bricks and mortar space. I'm, I'm worried about that. I'm not worried that we could triple, we could, we could many times over increase the use of technology for our students. How would we use our space differently? So this room is a, is a great example, and I love rooms like this. And I used to teach science, as you know, and lecture was a big part of that, right? Anytime you have this much material and this much time, lecture, our least effective way of teaching is the, the one we choose, the one we're forced to. But learning spaces will change. We're developing a facilities master plan right now, and we're talking about how are, we can create new professional technical pro workforce program space. We, we can do that because we can start converting some of our classrooms into that are used for liberal arts classes, perhaps, into that type of space. Liberal arts classes might look more, uh, less like this, less one person, more circular, if that makes sense, more relational. Imagine, uh, imagine that we go back to, uh, do we have and people that had degrees in education in the room? It was proud, just, you know, just shoot them up there. <laughs> I don't know, if you can all see this, there's another pyramid. I've never been to Egypt. 
So we have uh, levels that have been levels of cognition that we talk about, Benjamin Bloom's taxonomy, uh, half the types of thinking we need to do that you're all that you're all working on developing in your students. So those those different categories of cognition have been rena renamed by Bloom's student in the 1990s. They're now verbs, and at the top changed. It used to be judgment. It's now uh, it's now creating. That's at the top. That's what we do in, mu in music and art, whether I get your vote or not. When people ask you the importance of music and art, when you go into a performance humanities class, 90% of it is working on the highest level of cognition, and 10% of it is. Now in art, we have to remember that white light is a composite of many different colors, and if you spread it out, you can see the different colors. And now we're done with lecture, and go get to work. And this is the way you make things look like they're far away or close. Okay, and then you work. You get, to get busy on creating. So up here is creativity, application, knowing things, A, B, C. But sometimes, like in my discipline, this, and I love my discipline, and this is necessary for all you science folks out here, a lot of my biology classes, and I'm talking about into my upper division biology classes or my chemistry classes, a lot, and I'm not dissing you now. I'm saying the words have many syllables, but I'm still in a mode of memory. The cell has many parts, mitochondria, you know, the nuclei, the lysosomes, they do different things. These are their functions. That's memory, right? Imagine a classroom that's flipped, you know about flipped classrooms, most of you. A flipped classroom happened back in the 50s, and this is what it sounded like. I want you to go home and read J.D. Salinger's Catcher of the Rye, and come back, you know, next week and we'll discuss the first two chapters. That's a flipped classroom. The students are doing the content a lot on their own. The faculty member is getting them to talk to each other. They're getting them to learn from each other, probing, analyzing, developing their abilities to have an informed opinion. Because when it comes down to defending that liberal arts concept or why we put some of these classes in our professional technical disciplines, we want to move as a nation from people that, you know, everybody has an opinion. And your opinion is just as important as mine. We want to move our college-educated group to that I have an informed point of view. English, we call it 101. Your composition course teaches students not just writing, develop an informed point of view. Pick a subject, pick a topic, a thesis statement, develop in a cogent manner, and sum it up. So a flipped classroom, we may use our bricks and mortar for more of this. And I would love it if I spent time and put my courses into some sort of electronic form, and I'm talking about face-to-face -face classes now, not online. I'm face-to-face, -face, you're all part of my microbiology class, and before you can go to the lab this week, you're going to demonstrate on a computer, here at the college, or at home, or at Starbucks, or wherever you are, you're gonna demonstrate that you have this level knowledge before you ever come into the lab. You're gonna know all the little parts of the cells, you're gonna have them memorized, and when you show up, our face-to-face -face bricks and mortar at MPC is getting more people to hear faster, further, faster. And I'm not talking about online. I'm talking about using those tools. It's the same thing about assigning somebody to go off and read a book. It's the exact same thing we've been doing, except we're just using technology to make it better. Math can apply this fabulously. We're doing that at our college. It's called the Emporium Model. Nobody fails. I can take your class, I'm face to face, you introduce one concept in math, five minutes. I then, it's a big room, lots of computers, faculty members, some paraeducators walking around that don't cost the same amount, yeah, it's the, the budget thing. And I am struggling with, I can't go and take the homework until I demonstrate I have concept knowledge of that concept on the computer. 40 students in the class, we don't have 40. But I'm raising my hand and getting the attention, but all these other people are just breezing right through it. So I get my attention, and now I get, oh, I got it, then I, then I do the homework, and once I get satisfactory in the homework, I breeze through that, and now I can take the pre-quiz. I'm still sitting in the classroom. And once I take the pre-quiz, then they let me take the quiz. I don't think it's going to cause us to lose bricks and mortar, but it's, unless we want the legislature to make our decisions for us, so let's put into our facilities plans Ways that we can, we're teaching business, let's put on, you probably already are, but let's put on some business meetings. Let's, let's have a mock business meeting with that class time. Let's have students in, engaging in that way. 
and off campus in some of this content. That's the Khan Academy. I was listening to NPR again yesterday. I had a lot of time in the car yesterday. And the Khan Academy is doing that just up the road. That's that flipped model. Thank you. In today's budget climate, what criteria do you think should be used to prioritize the request for filling vacant positions or for new positions at NBC? Okay, so uh, in light of what I've just shared with the group, if we were to come together and say that we have a focus on uh, getting you know, a common technology, if we had an institutional initiative like that where we need to really focus on getting a universal web-based uh, format that settles us down, not having everything different in different employment classes with this group of the faculty here, that group of the staff there, uh, using different machines and software. If we had an initiative like that, that would have to take some priority. But otherwise, as a blanket statement, we need to look at, at the point of the bullseye, side, the drop of the water in the lake. We need to care for our students. We need to put a priority on those folks that are closest to our students and helping them do well in the classroom. And that's not just the faculty, but that's that's where we, we make a priority with that, and then we move out. And that's why, at Wenatchee Valley College, when I talked about some of the folks that we lost, most of those, none of them, we didn't rip a single faculty member. The faculty that left were, uh, they had retirement incentives for that to happen. Uh, but we, we looked for uh, who was farther away from that. We don't use words like essential, but those types of nonsense types of things that ruin the morale of campuses. But, but we do know that some of, our, some of our work is closer, and when we have vacancies there, we should make every effort. And when they are in disciplines that are historically very difficult for students, in a climate of success agenda, where funding's gonna be matched there, I think, and, and I certainly don't wanna put any pressure on any one of you, but I, I think we would have discussions even within instruction Right? Um, within the faculty vacancies, let's say, this is where the risk comes in for all of us. Uh, you know, if we're really struggling in mathematics, math is difficult. It's difficult, it's difficult, it's difficult everywhere. It's that intermediate algebra, isn't it, you math instructors? When you go from numbers to letters, yes, yeah, that's, that's the stumbling block. That's not a place where we really, if we're going to, you know, that's a good place to invest more. Because for our students, in terms of 15 units in college, 30 units in college, 60, first college level math, speed to degree. Math is the barrier to that for many students. That's not one I would break. So for even within the instruction, you know, the, the drop of water at the center of the bullseye, I think we need to, we, it's very difficult to prioritize disciplines, but I think if we look at it within the student success initiatives, we need to really, we need to let that disproportionate emphasis on funding make some of the, help us make some of those decisions. So math, as one example, would be a place where I think we'd look to replace right away. Thank you. Being as specific as possible, how do you see the community college landscape, and NPC in particular, five years from today? I kind of touched on it a little bit. You know, I, I really see the landscape being uh, a fabulous opportunity for us to bring in uh, different styles, or different styles of courses, I guess. Uh, truly, I'm not gonna go back over, but the, the, those times when we can use our face-to-face -face interactions with students to, for co-curricular activities, for student support, making MPC the choice. Yeah, I could go to another school or take a course online from some, somewhere else. But when I come to MPC, I get great student services. The faculty know my name. When I'm in those classes, I'm engaged, I'm talking. You're all adults, and, and the education level in this room is sweeping. And listening to me talk for this long, you all have opinions. You know, when you read the books about adult learners, you want to participate right now. You want to, you want to jump in there. Let's make our classes like that. So I think in five years, we're going to have more. Where if I were teaching a standard lecture science course, I would want to have more interaction. Now, if I'm in this kind of classroom, that's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. So I see, I see a lot of uh, actually efficient use of spaces, the hybrid model where students might come in to the same room, taking a three unit course and they show up for one hour a week in the same room. You can put a lot of courses into one facility. So there is some efficiencies there. And I'm saying efficiencies, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about efficiencies in dollars and space. I'm not talking about 
You know, it's really efficient if our students don't have to spend a lot of time with us. That's not efficient. <laughs> it's not good. So I, I don't want to be misinterpreted there, but again, please keep in mind that the budget is going to play a disproportionate role in the decision making. Thank you. What experience do you have with program discontinuance? With program discontinuance? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we had, uh, to my personal experience, it's going to be tough with your, uh, with your focus up the road at uh, Fort Ord, but when actually Washington, our fire science program was not a place that our local fire, uh, Wenatchee Fire Department, our largest potential employer, would not look to our graduates to be to be the, the ones. I'm not telling any fibs. That they have they have were, were being inappropriate. We had a great program that if a person wanted to become a fire chief, they needed to get that degree. But they tended to hire people within. It was a labor. It was a labor culture where people that came to that fire station and stayed in there, they got the job. So here we are in Little Wenatchee, Washington. We can't, we can't afford to send our, our students, our graduates, over to Seattle, two and a half hours over the mountains. Might get jobs, might not. So, we, so I canceled that program with our faculty. The same faculty member who was teaching that didn't lose his job, Bruce Murray. Uh, he also taught EMT, and the EMT program went as well, and he's still retained. He's our safety officer. Along with the exact same time that this was happening, more requirements for uh, homeland security type of, uh, of needs came to play, and he certainly filled in that role. And at this point, we're offering EMT programs of continuing education when we need to. We'll go out and teach those. Uh, natural resources. We're up in the Northwoods of Wenatchee. Um, it actually, it's in uh, scrub step environment. Lots of sagebrush, lots of ponderosa pine. Uh, our natural resources program is a degree program and a certificate program in the Wenatchee campus. And it was a degree program and a certificate program in OMAC. It requires majors ecology taught face to face. Now, on the Wenatchee campus, majors ecology, fully transferable to a four year regional four year university. We would get 10 students or so in Wenatchee. In OMAC, we, we just we didn't have the personnel to teach it. We wouldn't have that, that interest, so we reduced the degree program in OMAC, just have a certificate. Um, we do a lot of program reshaping and remodeling and stacking, stackable certificates, right? And it also dovetails into financial aid requirements. So a lot of the programs we haven't canceled, we have simply shuffled them to make short-term stackable certificates within a longer-term degree so the students are still financial aid eligible. Do a lot of moving around. We have a wonderful industrial tech program that's sort of generic. Like it, uh, it's not specific to any, any one employer, but those folks are OSHA and WISHA, ready to go. They can run forklifts. They know something about electricity. They can all do basic welding. And if they go out and work in an apple packing shed, that's where I'm at, you, that's where we, your apples come from. So if they go to an apple packing shed, they could be generally useful there. If they go to an automotive shop, they won't be an auto mechanic, but they could be a generally useful there. We have a retail management certificate that's just, you know, the bond, Jay-Z, Penny, so that's the type of industry we have. Uh, we definitely have reshaped our ag program, totally reshaped it. And we have a wonderful two plus two agreement with Washington State University. How do you see the role of the foundation, especially over the next five years? Foundation will continue to be a great partner during uh, the wonderful tour we had this morning. I saw many of the works of the foundation and the gifts that they're uh, helping to find in our community. I think that, like we were doing in Wenatchee, I think that at times we might need help more in operations. Things that you know, it's kind of tough when you're trying to find donors. Uh, they, it's really nice to have something that donors want to give to something that's. You know, here's a computer lab, and, you know, and, I, and I bought a computer, and that computer's going to be gone in five years. But we need more help like that, I think. We need, I think we need, um, or, or I think we could explore, is some of the avenues that were brought up in, in, in uh, YouTube's that I saw from Dr. Harris. I mean, if you look at your international student effort, and again, I apologize, I don't know all of your employees, but I think if, the, if we, let's say we're talking about greatly expanding that, well, that's a, that's a venture, that's an experiment. If the foundation helped us pay for a full-time employee for a short-term basis, you know, I was hired into one of those jobs in biotech. If you do a good job, you'll have a job for five years. If you don't do a good job, you won't have a job for five years. If the product works, 
you'll make a lot of money and move on. And if it doesn't, the company will close and you'll move on. It's the second story. So uh, if we get some seed money from the foundation, we might be able to put recruiters culturally sensitive, culturally aligned recruiters in various countries to represent us, to send their students, see how that works for a while. It's an experiment. I think that's very, very good use of the money. Um, just a closer relationship, which always starts with friend raising. It really starts with friend raising, where uh, you're not always just turning to the foundation when you need the money. And I know that that, that can't be true because I see your, your culture here, you're involved in. When you have a 65th anniversary this week, and I'm sure you have lots of uh, wonderful events. So, last question. Why do you want to work for Monterey Peninsula College? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, if it's, if it's not evident right now, I, I just uh, I'm just really impressed with uh, the academy here, with your courses, uh, and the climate of your your college. You know, community college. You're a comprehensive community college, meaning you, know, you do all those those mission areas, and you do well. You actually have a very broad curriculum within your transfer. It's very appealing. I love your international programs. Um, I I am more convinced now than I was before when I sent in my. And it has to do with who you are uh, to each other, the way you're working through these things. I'm, I'm learning that from the mood in the room this morning, the YouTube videos I'm watching, the many conversations I'm having, and I can't really quantify that for you. I'm not getting a feeling of uh, ultra-negativity in this really tough and really uncertain time. I'm getting a sense of community. Uh, you like each other. I mean, in this room this morning, you like it. Now, you know, I understand that very well. Uh, I, I really do think that uh, it's a healthy college. I said this in my, my interview. You're going to go through, we're going to continue to go through some very difficult times together. I think you on a real strong foundation. You've got a great community link. Our foundation is working well. Good, good relations with our community. And I, you know, I just have a lot of faith in, in what I see. I hope I'm the right person. I've been through some of the same things. I'll focus on leadership at all levels, not just me, obviously. It can't just be that. I can't just be at that level. And empowering, clearing paths. I hope you agree as well. Thank you. Please join me in thinking about this.